Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. Hey, Yule. Hey, Phil. How are y'all doing? Uh, I have a cold. Oh, you do? Yeah, this oh, sucks. man. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm doing great. I'll man up for you guys, though. Yeah, mm. it's good. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks. Today we'll be covering chapters 14 through 18 of Shadows Linger by Glenn Cook. We are not going to be reticulating, going back and forth between groups of people main characters from chapter to chapter because everybody that matters is in juniper now it is late winter and let's jump into the chapters yes why wait juniper duratil so whisper has delivered croaker and several other people to duratil in juniper they are being cloistered. The Duke there doesn't want anybody to know that they're there for various reasons. And meanwhile, Feather and Whisper are ferrying people back and forth until they have their full complement of 25. They stay there for a week to get all those people over. They do, but in the meantime, they're introduced to the only person who shares a language with them, this guy named Bullock, who we've heard about before. People are scared of him down in the... Uh, what's that place called? Barrel? No. The, the, the Gem Cities? No, they're not afraid of him there, man. The buskin. The buskin. Oh, the buskin. Yes. Oh, yes. hey, well, you know, I got I got sidetracked a little bit. No kidding? This is one of the parts of this novel that I really appreciate, is that when you go someplace new, even though on the same continent, they speak different languages, and you have to learn the language. There's a lot of different languages, versus like a lot of other novels where everybody on the entire everybody planet speaks, speaks English. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh. Do you remember when we were making fun of Crone for speaking English? <laughs> yeah, I, I do, I do. I was just like, and, and she actually speaks yeah, English, as a matter of fact. Yeah. To be sidetracked, this is a part of the novel and Glenn Cook's writing and the realism that I really appreciate. Yeah, there happens to be a guy that speaks their language. But the rest of the time, they have to use interpreters until they learn the language. It's a language in common. I don't know that it's theirs because they're all from the South. But the languages that he is able to speak, Bullock, are the Jewel City languages. So that's Beryl, Opal, and Garnet. I don't know if there are any others, but they can speak with this guy. And Croker takes an immediate disliking to him, says he's a thug, a cop that would use a truncheon to solve his cases. Croker's perception is that as soon as the captain got there, that, you know, the lady would just take over management of the, the entire town. And that this guy would survive because the lady's military governors need people just like him. That are capable of ruling with savageness <laughs> the iron fist of brutality that he's known for well it turns out that they were brought here for that fortress over there the duke takes them out on the parapets once they have translators in common and everybody has arrived whisper and feather are there uh, he goes into a good history that was i guess a revelation it's been there for centuries when what did he say how, how long and it was just a black rock sitting there and some guy touched it and died they found a dead man and that rock and the guy that found it touched the rock and died also and then they experimented with it and they had more people touch it and they died so <laughs> like at what point do you just stop touching it i think they were trying to destroy it i don't think they were touching it experimentally yeah i, I got the uh, idea that they were trying to destroy it but they spent a lot of time to do so but it never got destroyed they decided to ignore it because it was maddening, you know, they were spending a lot of effort. And he said that it has grown very quickly in the last few years. Since Raven showed up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there are rumors swirling around. This is being delivered to us by some, I don't know, I, it doesn't matter, it's just some guy. And he's pompous and he's a prick. Hargadon! He doesn't believe the rumors, but he's telling us the rumors. And the rumors are that there are not nearly enough bodies coming in from the buskin. That the homeless people normally dropping dead at this time of year they're not finding them like they normally would well we talked about that last time and we're like we something doesn't fit here they would know yeah. and sure enough they know they know perfectly well again the things we we called shenanigans on previously it turned out to be written into the next chapter so yet again restores my faith in glenn cook as an author that ties up these loose ends and makes it realistic and believable mm -hmm. and so when there's something we clearly don't comprehend in the future maybe we can say there's a reason we just may not know it so what is the reason for them keeping the Black Company hidden? It sounds like this place is going to be, you know, uh, Pawn of the Ladies, right? And there are still rebels out there. 
there's rebels in the city. They're expats, essentially. And they don't really want, uh, like, the black company going around and, and, like, alerting these people, right? I don't think that's what it is. The pretense that he gave was that he didn't want there to be unrest in the city because of their presence. Just because they're there. He said it was because of those expats, the rebel expats. Right. But it just, it's such a thin excuse. I don't, I don't really buy it. It says right there, the Duke feared the refugees would incite trouble if he was suspected of collaborating with the lady. And it does seem thin because... Well, as we go through the chapter, it gets thinner and thinner, too. Or the chapters. Ultimately, and the reality is, no matter how you look at it, they have a problem that they cannot solve. And it's evil, they think. And the most powerful evil sorceress they know is the lady, so maybe they reached out for help. Croker said that they wanted something for free. So it sounds like they don't want to appear weak for having to ask for help from the outside, but they don't want anybody to know that they asked for help from the outside. So it's like having your cake and eating it too. We'll do all the investigation and we'll get all the accolades, but you know, we'll call you when we really need you, I guess. The plan for the Black Company is that they're going to solve this problem, but they're not allowed to go out and do any of the work themselves. They're stuck having people deliver information to them, and then the information they're getting is fuzzy. Croker calls it as filtered, sanitized, and useless. So Whisper goes and has a uh, sharp, harsh word with the Duke, and thereby Croker becomes the shadow of Bullock, the bully, the cop that works for the custodians. The secret police and Bullock and the custodians don't want the black company there. One, it, it's like saying they can't do their own job. And two, they quite possibly view them as a threat, in and of themselves because they don't want the lady there and they represent both how about this though what's their job uh you mean like the black company yeah why are they there they're there to deal with the black castle has or... nothing to do with the city no the real reason to be there is to take over the entire city which is what's going to happen that's with... what they assumed was going to happen i think it's croker making assumptions <laughs> He said, I expected annexation to occur within days of the captain's arrival. We'd have it scoped out before he got here. I think it's going to be a little while. Oh, that's true. One word from Charm would do it. Okay, so they don't have, that's not their orders. Mm -mm. They think, uh, I think you're right. They think it was their orders, and they could do it on a dime once they got that official confirmation. They're probably going to two birds, one stone it. But in the meantime, they don't have a lot of business in the city. Croker does get attached to Bullock somehow. Oh, he just bluffs his way, and he said, oh, it's, it's orders, and he's like, fine. Well, they're heading into the busk and looking for old coins. That's what Bullock says. Yeah. We know why. We do. Know because why. those old, old coins that got stolen, they're expecting them to be spent now. I like this exchange a lot. You found out that Bullock isn't just this meat-headed thug. He's actually pretty sharp. Bullock was kind of saying something about the citizens and how, you know, maybe we'll find a couple stupid ones that are spending coin. And Croker thinks, you know, maybe it's because Bullock is dumb like these people. Yeah, he said Bullock had a good grasp of the stupid size of human nature. Not a compliment. Is that when he says meow? Yeah, 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 yeah which I didn't get. What I don't get mean? it either. It, uh, I don't know. Was a cat fight I know, such a thing said... at one time? I have no I can't idea. imagine, but it does feel like it was a very catty thing to say, so meow. <laughs> that stood out as out of place. It didn't make sense to me either, but I'm, I don't think Bullock was stupid. I, I just think that he's like... He's uh, not he... dumb, but tell me about him, because we'll see lots of reasons why he's not dumb. Bullock isn't stupid. He comes from this area... He's had a hard life, and he was able to get out of the buskin by becoming, you know, he's like an administrator of justice, if you will. He's this weird uh, segue, because he's kind of the head of the secret police, but he's also a devout... He's not the secret police at all. He's the secret police work for the Duke. But he knows all of those folks very well. But he's kind of an investigator for the custodians. He's the only authority figure that will actually come down to this area. Like the other cops that are like celebrated as heroes, I'm calling them cops, they won't even come down to the buskin. They're chicken. This guy's coming down to investigate and he knows how to cajole with these people, you know, because he's from this area. And he was lucky enough to get out. Upon further conversation, we find out that his father was not able to. It was a racket where, you know, you have to pay gangs for protection, and he didn't get protection from another gang, so he refused to pay, and he died. Bullock took care of that. 
<laughs> Bullock did take care of that, yes. He said, I, I deliver their bodies to the custodians myself. That's right. I love it. <laughs> the catacombs. I took them there myself. <laughs> well, Croker thinks he is a fanatic, like a religious zealot. And we'll leave Croker's appraisal there because it will change through time. Croker imagines briefly that, oh man, wouldn't it be great if we could just move down here and take this place over? The buskin, the slum, like our guys would be at home in here. And if only we had Raven, <laughs> it would just be the perfect place for us. I like how he was like hoping for Raven. It was uh, Maybe I was a little ham-fisted because, you know, how much time in Croker's entire time in the Black Company was Raven even there? Oh, very brief. Maybe a year. But he did suggest that, what, what One Eye? Mm-hmm. One Eye is a gangster. He's a He's born a gangster. He's a gangster. He knows how to run this place, but he would be the only uh, black person in this area. He said he hadn't seen another black face since they crossed the ocean. Right. Mm. I and mean, that kind of plays up what Phil was saying in this world, in Glenn Cook's world. You can go from one continent to another continent, or even on the same continent, you might not speak the same language. And here we, it's nice that we have a difference in skin color, if you will, and it makes sense within the universe. Well, one of the reasons Bullock accepts Croker's company is because Croker is quick to pick up the language. So Croker's speaking his language, at least some, and that's, that goes a long way, I'll tell you what. They're doing the rounds. Bullock is going from inn to whorehouse to tavern to slum, and they're questioning people, looking for that old coin. Taverns, cat houses, and reeking dives. I would love to do this sort of investigative work. That's all mm. I'm saying. <laughs> well, after Bullock has questioned the proprietor of the Iron Lily, he gets an idea, and he's like, hey, we should go check out some money lenders too. Croker says uh, that, Oh, it must have been in the time he was talking to that innkeeper of the Iron Lily that the guy was, like, complaining about all this money that he owed and all this other stuff, and then that's when they clicked in for Bullock to go and check that's out right. money lenders. pretty smart. Because if somebody's stealing money, that's probably because they're paying it to somebody else. That's right. A great leap of logic. So they go and they visit Craig. They're in his neighborhood presently, so they're, they're just going to go and visit him. And he's described as like a nasty piece of work by this guy who has himself been described as a nasty piece of work. When they get there, Bullock just walks in completely unafraid of everyone. Craig is wrapped in bandages like a mummy. Yeah, he got messed up bad in a previous encounter with Raven. Allegedly. Nobody said it was Raven that did it, so it Maybe must... they have never saw him. You know, maybe it was so bad and so fast that they have no idea that right. it was actually Raven. They just think it was. Everybody thinks it's Raven going out. Craig definitely oh, thinks it's Raven. Oh, it's so Raven to go out there and stab people and not let them know, you know. Craig is like, what do you want? And we get the story here that they're looking for Cajun coins or something to that effect, right? Right. From that period of time. Bullock does not tell Craig why they're looking for coins from that period. He won't do it. He just says that somebody got hit that does not stand to be hit. And Craig is like, huh? He doesn't believe it. But Bullock does to let him know. He's just like, anybody involved is going down. This whole part where Croker and Bullock are hanging out feels so much like an obvious cop movie. It was good. And here we're getting a really fun interrogation scene with Craig. He isn't having any of it either. And when they're finally done with the conversation, he's like, so did you get what you want? And he's all, maybe you should leave now. So Craig invites them to get the F out, and they do, because they've got no more information. Croker says, you know, if you had told him why, maybe he would have been more forthcoming. And Bullock's like, no, 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 that can never get out. There would be rioting in the streets if people didn't think we could take care of the dead. That's the one thing that everybody agrees to, it seems like, in this town, in this place, is that the dead are very, they're revered. When I read it, I was like, yeah, well, why didn't he just tell them? And that's, that's why, because... He covered it. Yep, can't tarnish the reputation of the custodians. So Bullock suggests, well, well, let's keep going. We've got a few more visits to make before dark. And then there's this really nice moment where Croker's like, what do you mean? We have a time limit? And he's like, yeah, it gets dangerous down here at dark, man. And he <laughs> smiles and Croker's like, oh, I can't help but like the guy a little bit. Well, as tough as he is, even he is like aware that. Uh... I don't think he wants to be down there alone. And he doesn't know if Croker has his back at all. So I, you might as well discount him entirely as being support, right? Get out of there before dark. But it's at this point in time when Croker is like, 
he thought he saw somebody he knew. Like, just the way the person was walking. And he's like, oh, I'm just somebody I was thinking about earlier. Obviously, we know who he was thinking about earlier. That's where it's a little heavy-handed, right? A I mean, they bit, are yeah. in the same place, but... Yeah, how would they know? Yeah, he wouldn't. He that'd wouldn't be the know. one thing. Is he just longing for Raven always? No, there's no way he thinks about Raven every day. What were they, besties? I mean, they were talking about setting up a sting kind of situation, and that's what they did with Raven, right? So it makes sense that they would do that. You're right. It's a little heavy-handed, but it's okay, because it, otherwise it's a great chapter. Right? I like the chapter. I, I don't like think chapter. it was heavy-handed. You know, I hate it when you have this convergence, absolutely illogical convergence of people that never really would have met. Especially in sci-fi, where some guy just happens to go to a planet and he runs into the person he met 10 years ago. I'm like, that's unlikely on a planet of 50 billion people. It's unlikely on a planet of a million people. But let's be honest. Raven's in the buskin. They're in the buskin. It's not that unreasonable. I, I don't know. I really like the way it was done. I bought it. How about that? Well, it's not quite a convergence yet. It's there. I can taste it. juniper death of a gangster so ace is alive yeah and he's being taken care of in the room and told to stay put because you know there's people talking about him they're taking turns nursing him back to health but man i was a hundred percent convinced they had sold him for money oh i didn't think they did and that he was in the walls of that castle i wasn't sure if he was but it was alluded that they made an offer for oh, yeah. his body. They, oh, they did. 340 they did. for the two live ones, you know. One of them was Asa, you know, so. At the beginning of this chapter, in addition to finding out that Asa is alive, we find out that Shed and his mother have been arguing violent arguments, but I guess it's not really she violent. She knows. She stares at him with mm-hmm. blind eyes. Mothers mm. always find out. Shed is off to pay Craig the money that he owes him. And we find out that Count didn't die. He's too stupid to die. Craig's a little bit better. He's a lot better. He's wincing at his wounds. He's pulling at the bandages, but he's no longer wrapped up like a mummy. He's able to be kind of jovial and affable with Shed, which worries Shed a little bit. But, you know, he owes eight and some change. Shed pays up in full. Craig counts out the change. And he says, okay, but now, now I'm calling in that favor. We're going to get Raven and you're going to help me do it. Poor Shed. He's he's always a pawn in someone else's machinations, it seems. Yeah, and he, he calls it a trap. And he's like, no matter what I do, I'm always trapped. So Shed argues, maybe you should let this one go. Raven is a nasty, mean, deadly piece of work. And he might kill you. And I don't mean to insult you, but he doesn't really take it quite so seriously either. Yeah. <laughs> That was nice. And Craig is really honest with him here. Oh, yeah, I love it. Now that they're even Steven or whatever, and he's paid up in full, he's like, look, I've got to do this. either him or me. My business is going to fall apart if I don't kill him. Uh, Do you remember what what Shed and Raven had talked about several chapters ago? And that's what Shed said to Raven. That he had no choice. Yeah, It's going to be him or you. you, And he's like, well, I guess it's going to be him then. (laughs) Obviously, (laughs) Raven would say that, right? He's all nonchalant about it. Well, okay. If if it has to be one of us, it's going to be him. But Shed asks him, where will your business be if he kills you? Craig says, I don't have any choice. I love that. This is it. It's now or never. Well, it's it's pride, it's ego, it's his identity, and he couldn't imagine a world where he wasn't on top or respected. I mean, I assume he's the alpha right now, but if he can't maintain control, somebody who thinks they're the alpha is going to challenge him and take his business. So he has to maintain that reputation of being on top. Whatever, it doesn't matter. You guys understand. It's like lions. All right, so Shed goes back to the Iron Lily and he reports to Raven. They're coming for you. They're, they told me to, to sell you out. And I was like, all right. He's like, all right, well, who's it going to be, him or me? He says, it's time for Craig to go up that hill. And he said, like, it's time for us to take him to the Black Castle. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the plan? Because Raven has a plan. Under Raven's orders, Shed is going to go talk to Craig. And he's going to tell Craig that Raven and Asa have been working together to take bodies up to the Black Castle. And the next time Raven goes out, Shed is going to betray him by running to Craig and saying, tonight's the night. 
we can follow him tonight. That's the plan. It doesn't really sound like much of a plan. So there is a small hitch. Everything goes according to plan until Craig says, okay, well, you're coming with us. Yeah, he wants him at hand just in case. If this is a trap, he's going to make sure that Shed dies first. Yeah, he has lots of good reasons for not trusting Shed in this moment. Ooh, this is another good one I like. Yeah, it's very all, good. What do you mean? I've always been on your side, Craig. I never would do anything to hurt you. You've always done whatever a coward would do, so how could I possibly trust you? Exactly, and it, Craig knows. Even yeah, if Craig he doesn't does. know, he knows. He's a uh, student of human nature, I would say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not a stupid guy either. You maybe think he might be. But no, I, I don't think anybody that's actually stupid can get into that position that he's in. Sure. Somebody smart will come along Maybe and cut their throat. Maybe stupid you know? is not the right word then. But, you know, since he is so unscrupulous. Well, he's just a brutal operator. Yeah, yeah, he is. Well, Shed has a knife up his sleeve, believe it or not. Yeah, he carries it so he can feel confident when he goes into situations he's not really <laughs> ready for. It's a butcher knife, and they know him as such a coward, and I guess they've searched him so many times that they didn't bother searching him this time. But he has it. He's got a knife up his sleeve. There's a few times uh, in this chapter where people are like, oh, you don't need a knife. We'll take care of you, Shed. Oh, or, that big guy on the roof. Or, yeah. Shed, what are you going to do with a knife? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they go in pursuit of Raven, this big gaggle of people. It's like six people plus Craig and Shed. And then a seventh person that's been tracking Raven shows up. And then an eighth person that's been tracking him shows up. It's winter, it's cold, and they found Raven's wagon. Raven went into an alley in Chandler's Way, and he hasn't come out of that alley 10 minutes ago. Shed is sent along with Luke to go down and figure out where Raven went. And that's where Shed becomes a man. (laughs) Yeah, he does. He's pushed in such a corner. They figure out where Raven went. He shimmied up a gutter, up to the top of a roof, and Shed... Shed takes out poor old Luke. No, but Luke was just like, oh, he went up this gutter. Follow me, Shed. And he started up, and as soon as he did, that's right. Knife is out, and bam. Stabbed him right in the back. So that's murder number one. Ding. But he's smart about it, too. He covered up his mouth until he stopped breathing. Then he buried him with trash and snow. The long and short of the whole thing is that up on the roofs, Raven has been trying to isolate people one at a time and kill them. And Shed is doing everything he can to help. He's been pushed too far. He's no longer even afraid. He's just committing murders when the opportunity arises. I thought it was cool just how Raven was voice mimicking and dividing and conquering them. It was brilliant. I think the biggest mistake, the thing that was the least believable, was once we have Craig up on the roof. And remember, he's still fairly wounded, right? He's recovering from injuries. He got up onto the roof somehow found shed shed talks his way into not getting murdered and then craig he's trying to climb down the gutter again and he goes first and i was like no 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 you send shed down first but he didn't he started climbing down and shed stomps his hands there was a lot of shed talking being a coward number one he was overly talking so he could get raven's attention yes just lure him to where he is just in case that needs to happen Another thing he was doing was he was annoying the people that he was with to the point where they say, shut up or I'm going to kill you myself. Mm -hmm. And when you're angry like that and you just want to get down and go home because that was the plan, because this guy's wiping us out, that might be the reason why he might have let himself open because it's just the coward shed at my hands anyway could not believe that Shed was capable of anything other than cowering and whining. and That would be my defense of it. I think Yule is right. Craig was getting flustered and impatient and annoyed at Shed, and so he was losing focus. Oh, he lost focus. And when he falls and hits the ground, he's still alive, but he's paralyzed. Oh, he's moaning. <laughs> so Shed is now alone with a bunch of bodies scattered around down in the alleyway. And he loads Craig onto the wagon. And then he goes and gets other bodies. Yeah, but Craig shrieked. Not only that, I think Shed lords his little, his power over Craig. You know, he's like, you thought it was a trap. You were right. A cool moment. It's also kind of sadistic that the person that was being bullied is so easily able to become a bully also. 
Well, he told Craig that he had pushed him too far. He pushed him so far that he was he hated him more than he was afraid of him. You got to have that perfect amount of fear. Well, Raven shows up, dumps a body in there, and he's like, how the hell? Because the wagon is loaded full of bodies. And there's old shed there. He's like, well, I loaded them all up for you, sir. <laughs> they go, they take off for the Black Castle. And the tall, thin preacher, whoever he is, up at that castle, was laughing maniacally. He offered 120 leva just for Craig. <laughs> uh, and they could hear him screaming as they're driving away. And he's like, why is he still screaming? He's like, don't worry about it. Don't think about <laughs> just, it. Just, just go. But Raven's like, I'm done. That's it. That's the last time I'm ever going up there. I've, I've got enough money now. He says, Shed, come with me. I couldn't dare leave, Shed says. I got my mother. And you know what? I've got enough money. It doesn't. I can fix up the lily. I don't even need to make money next year. I've got so much. I'm set. You know, they kind of talk about the Black Castle and... How tempting it's going to be when he does need money again. Exactly. And yeah. Raven's like, you got to get away from the Black Castle. All right. So we close this chapter and it's uh, June's blind stare accusing Shed of wrongdoings. What I was alluding to, what this reminded me of was Dostoevsky. Oh, uh, is she blind in that? No, no, it's not that. It's that his morality is like torturing him. I was thinking the telltale heart, but mm. there's no old woman in that as far as I remember. Juniper, nasty surprise. So Bullock invites Croker along once again. Craig and half of his men are missing, so they're going into the buskin to investigate. This is when Croker is shown the enclosure, the entrance where the poor people are had been getting in during the winter. He's like, this is how they got in to get into the catacombs. And he takes him into the enclosure, and Croker's like, can we see where they got in? And he's like, Ugh. there's this really nice moment. He says he wanted to say no. But instead of saying no, he said, it's like an hour's hike. And he kind of just gives him the information. He does, he's not a bully to Croker, right? He likes him enough that he tries to dissuade him. He says, we got a lot of work to do. And it's like an hour away. <laughs> right. So maybe later, maybe some other time. All right. So down in Craig's territory, Bullock is meeting with some of his personal contacts and Croker is not invited. So Croker goes and he sits in a bar and he drinks some alcohol by himself. When Bullock arrives, they drink together for a little while and Bullock pays for his alcohol. He was given it for free on the house, but he paid for it anyway. And this endears him more to Croker also. Yeah. He likes him for this. He said that he has like ethics that he wouldn't make the lives of the people down in the buskin harder than they already were. Right. And that is very nice because you've got, you know, somebody like Craig who is feeding off of the people in the buskin. He is a bloodsucker. Well, Bullock and Proker are talking about what they know about all of these kind of storylines they're investigating. And Bullock starts cross-referencing the wood thief story with the body thief stories and also with the Craig disappearance stories. And one name comes to the top of his list. Oh, Really? What's that? Asa. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Raven. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> sort of, yeah. yeah. Well, he's got that list of people who were seen gathering wood out of the enclosure. Right. And you know, through a series of questions along with Cro you know, Croker's asking, he's like, well, did somebody rent a wagon? And he's all, don't be stupid. Nobody would. And he's like, I thought we were talking about stupid people here, you know? You know, they had two wagons, so one of them was rented. I assume Asa was renting it. Now. We know Asa was w renting a wagon. All right, so we've got a list of names of people gathering wood. We've got this interesting name, this guy named Raven, his foreigner who had a feud with Craig. Croker hears that, and he's like, Raven? It can't be my Raven. He's thinking to himself, you know. He wants Bullock to get him information on this Raven character later on, you know, he's, but he's trying to do it in such a way, he's trying to be sly about it. He went so far as to discourage Bullock from questioning Raven directly. He right. was trying to get Bullock to kind of circumvent Raven while investigating and getting a physical description of him and seeing who he's traveling with. But he didn't want Bullock to actually go and talk to Raven. Yeah, he wants to make sure it's his Raven, right? 
Well, yeah, on top of other things, yeah. yes, obviously. I mean, that's ultimately, I think, what it is, right? Well, Raven has been seen hanging out with the rebel expats who are now living here in Juniper. They call it the Crater Crowd. Yeah, I don't know what that is in reference to, but... Nor do I, but that's kind of the, the rebels from all over... They were the Battle of Charm, dispersed, and some of them went so far as here, and they coalesced into Sunday morning coffee clutch or something that gets together and talks about the good old days. Or the bad old days, as it were. So as soon as he is able, Croker bolts to go and find Elmo and Goblin to let, mm-hmm. it, let them know that uh, sounds like Raven might be here, and we might have a problem. They decide that it's time to move down into the Buskin. Goblin and six of the soldiers take rooms down there. It seems to me like they're almost forcing the issue. That they don't feel completely prepared to do it. They don't feel like all the proper people are in place. And they feel like the best people for the job would be recognized by Raven. And they can't have them down there. So they send in the B team. Including Sweet Beat. Palm Broker should have known Raven. Apparently he was so new when the Battle of Charm happened that they just assumed he wouldn't remember him. Juniper travel plans. So Shed catches Asa trying to sneak out. I assume he's been cloistered in the Iron Lily, and he's uh, he's going a little stir crazy. So he wants to get outside, but he's told that Bullock has been asking specifically for you, Asa. You should probably not go get caught and get everybody else busted and killed. Which is not completely true. It isn't completely true, but it's a very very good story to tell somebody that you cannot trust. Right. He's like, hey, you know, Raven gave you all that coinage and you went out and spent it. He didn't, though. He didn't spend it. He's suggesting that maybe he would spend it, I guess. He had been plundering the catacombs by himself for a while and probably spending some of that coin. And then Raven paid him his share for the looting all in that old coin. A huge lump sum, yeah. And he's like, I'm rich and I can't spend it. Oh, that's horrible. So it comes out that Raven is heading south as soon as the harbor opens and that maybe Asa can go with him. Right. Shed is like, come on, you might ask him. <laughs> oh, wait, was that Shed's idea or Asa's idea? It was Shed making Shed it Shed suggests Asa's maybe idea. you travel. Maybe travel for a little while. Get out of town. I've never left like, anywhere before hmm. in my life. <laughs> the idea is that he's going to ask permission. Right. Shed's looking Raven. out for himself, let's be honest. For sure he is, and that's exactly when Ace is like, hey, I never thanked you. I owe you the big one. It sounded like he saved his life when he was in the back of that wagon, and he didn't allow him to be spent, you know, sold. I'm not 100% sure that he's aware that he was on the chopping block to be sold. But... I don't know, but something made me feel like that's what he was talking about. In yeah. the very least, when he got hurt, he was saved. You know what I mean? They didn't kill him or leave him to be dead, which sure either thing. way, it could have happened super, super easy. Raven would have killed him or let him die or sold him, right? Well, it looks like Raven had a better idea. Raven, at least the the way it was implied, was looking at his body like, there's a payday. Uh, and Shed said, nope, don't do it. Don't even think it. He's my buddy. I, no, because remember in the very, in the very beginning, Asa was uh, Shed's project. Trying to rehabilitate and inspire the man. Shed has a weird relationship with Asa. They have a weird relationship. Like, they kind of like each other, but they disappoint each other. They don't trust each other. They're neither reliable. But he still lets him get firewood and come and sleep in his, you know, in his floor. He lets him come and hang out and did hide him when his life was in jeopardy. And nursed him back to health when he was dying, yes. Exactly. Could have died. Right. But he's also doing it partially to keep him out from, you know, public. So, well, aren't all of our motivations kind of complicated? Like nobody has pure motives. There's always some self-interest involved. Like let's be cynical and realistic about it. It makes perfect sense that you're going to do things that align with what you want as well as which are, you know, maybe good for your family and friends. I remember reading something a long time ago talking about, it was a treatise on how everything we do is motivated by selfishness. 100%. We selfishly help people because it makes us feel good and that we get that payoff. So we're really doing it for ourselves. Oh, yeah, I I completely agree. But I'm a cynic, so I would agree. What's the difference between an optimist and a cynic? Hmm. A cynic is an optimist with more experience. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
Oh. All right, so the apology out of the way. Shed's too embarrassed to stay there and be a man. So he goes downstairs, and Raven and Darling are having a heated sign language argument. They must be together. Yeah, he makes that assumption that they're a couple because of how they always argue and stuff. But he waits until Raven, they're done with the conversation, and Raven sees him, and then he lets him know that Asa wants to go with you when you leave. And it's kind of agreed that that might not be a bad idea. And it would get Asa out of Shed's hair, too, for a while. And then Shed says, Bullock was asking about you, by the way. Well, he brought that up at the end, because Raven called him out, and he said, you just want Asa gone because it covers your butt. And then Raven says, hmm, kind of covers my back trail, too. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> but then he, yeah. but then Shed offers the information, perhaps in his own way of saying thank you. Shed is not forthcoming. All these people hold their cards to their chest very, very well. Asa with Shed, Shed with Craig, Craig with Bullock. They all are not telling everybody everything. Hey, can you imagine living in a world where, like, there you had no one you could trust? Like, no one. And maybe that's why he loves and is so, so devoted to his mother, because his mother's the only one who will love him unconditionally. But apparently that's not true either. <laughs> I think there are conditions. Yeah, I think there are conditions. What book did we read where we were advised to keep our information? It was Topper with Perrin on the road after the slaughter in Itko Khan. In the Gardens of the Moon. He told Perrin to treat his information like it was a currency yeah. and to hold tight to it. Yeah. Yeah, but those were high-level like schemes. That was very Machiavellian stuff. These guys are like in the gutter, man. They're just being petty all the time. No, 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 no. Life is still on the line here. It doesn't matter where they are. Like Their lives are still at risk. Juniper blowing smoke. What does blowing smoke mean to you guys? <laughs> no, not blowing smoke up your ass. Blowing That's exactly smoke. what I think. That's not what it is, though. Blowing smoke. What does it mean? Hookahs, it's smoke signals. It's a diversion. Bullock and Croker are making the rounds once again. Goblin is very conspicuously standing in the street trying to get Croker's attention. He's like, Jesus, he's going to get noticed. It's like one of the only guys Bullock has noticed before, like, knows. In the group, he says. He's conspicuous. He's recognizable. He's a foreigner. He stands out. He does not belong. Bullock would recognize him. There's no way Bullock would not notice him. Except that he didn't. Supposedly. Maybe he's a wizard. Maybe that's how he did it. I don't know. Oh. Anyway, Croker goes to pee in the alleyway and has a conversation with Goblin. It's our raven, unfortunately, but it's him. Darling's with him. They're pretending like they don't know each other very well. They talked about his cart that had fresh blood in it also. It's his cart and his team of horses, and he checked it out on the day that the catacombs were raided, and there's fresh enough blood to line up pretty well with the day that Craig and all of his men went missing. Yeah, he only takes it out at night, but he did take it out in the day one time. One <laughs> time. Yeah. And, yeah. and that was the same day they raided the catacombs. Mm -hmm. So Raven has been selling bodies to whoever's up in the Black Castle, and Croker thinks of it as the castle that Raven built. <laughs> I think that with the conversation that we heard in the beginning of this episode uh, yeah, about how only in the last few years has it dramatically increased in size, the Black and, Castle. And how long has he been in town? I think it's apparent for sure that raven's the person that built this thing it's stated very subtly but it's there overtly also it says that raven's been here for a few years and then it's been growing rapidly in the last few years so you can put two and two together and make five no problem Dude, they should just call it castle raven <laughs> <laughs> it's a castle Raven built. I mean, it's hilarious. Or what's that Forgotten Realms place? Raven's Bluff. They should just call it Raven's Bluff. Raven's, Not Raven. Raven Loft. <laughs> Raven Loft. No, oh, Raven Ra Loft is the world in D&D. &D oh, Raven Loft. Raven. I was thinking Raven's Bluff, but that's okay. okay. All right, so the diversion, the, the namesake of the chapter is that Croker is trying to set a diversion for Bullock. He's trying to divert everybody's attention away from Raven. He makes this suggestion... That guy you were looking for, the foreigner, he's actually been in contact with all of the crater crew. 
And so maybe it's a political thing. Maybe they're trying to fund the rebellion. And Bullock's like, I didn't think of that. Maybe. Rebellions need lots of money. <laughs> Croker describes it as the smoothest raid ever. They gather up effortlessly without any blood whatsoever. This old group of rebels that n have no fight left in them whatsoever. He has people on the inside, police on the inside, right? That have been working with the crater gang. I guess that it was the secret police had somebody inside or they were getting information from them somehow. Yeah, Right. So they got like, you know, a secret meeting together. They're, they're not even secretive about their meetings, right. man. They're just drinking in a bar, unarmed, talking about old times. All the people that were rebels were like actually relieved to be caught. They're like, <laughs> it's oh, it's the over. black company. You guys act. It sounds like they were all taken to what, Whisper? They got taken up to Duratil where Whisper and Feather worked on them. I think they were probably going to read their minds. Oh, I see. Which is why Croker said it was a gamble that he was playing the long game because if Raven had told these people about Darling, everything was going to be bad. Right. But he was counting on Raven keeping that a secret, and he did. Well, that's because Raven didn't even tell his friends when he knew. You're talking about the Black Company friends? Mm-hmm. No, it was too risky. You remember how he was treating Croker at the end of the Black Company? Yeah, he was He was distancing himself from everybody. Wouldn't you? I mean, he, Croker was going to talk to the lady in person like every day. You know, they were buddy-buddy. They were chummy. And it was like, do you dare risk that information? No, you don't. That's true. You know, you got me there. That's true. You you couldn't tell anybody because on a moment's notice, they could get their mind sucked and then the whole the whole gig was up. So it's a gamble. and It looks like the gamble paid off. I did not hear from Whisper, so I guess I'd won. I hope he won. Otherwise, there would be no third book, which is titled The White Rose. Raven's plan is to get out once the harbor opens. It's late winter now. And the harbor is bound to open up fairly soon, sometime in spring, obviously, right? And his plan is to ditch at that point with Darling. He's got enough money now, but now uh, the harbor isn't open. And the only way in or out of Juniper is by flying carpet. All of the mountain passes are closed and the harbor's closed. Now Raven and Darling have to survive long enough for the harbor to open and get out. And Asa has to keep under wraps. Oh, man, that guy is a disaster waiting to happen. Shed isn't much better. Shed's a lot better. I got to uh, wonder if uh, Raven said that uh, Asa could go with him just so he could just, like, you know, basically kill him on the road. Gut him, throw him overboard, and then take his stash. He said he needed men. He did, but what does he need men for? And if you did need men, why would you go with Asa? He argued that he could control him. He knew how to handle Asa. And he needed men. And if you think about it, he will need men. He'll need retainers. He'll like if his plan is to set up Darling as the White Rose, as a general, mm. to fight the lady, he's gonna need everybody that he Why well, didn't think about it that far ahead? Do you remember how at the end of the Black Company <sighs> Raven was spending a lot of time with Darling and she was asking questions that like a young prince would ask or a, a general in training would ask? Yes, I remember, yeah. I mean, she. I mean, she he was just very insightful when it came to higher level tactics. Well, I think he's training her too. I think he's encouraging that behavior, and I think that that's her future because the last White Rose was a general. Is it a little tropey? We look on things now, and we've seen so many things that have been influenced by things from the past, and so you know, taking that into consideration, is this White Rose thing just a little bit? When we say now, it's very tropey. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, right. I honestly forgot, so I can't tell right now. Okay. Oh, kind of like the uh, Sleeping Beauty thing? Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, I guess maybe like that. You what know, am I thinking? The, of? Oh, Snow White. The one young kid that will, like, you know, Snow save White. the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Snow White. she was just fairest, but... Yeah, but she ultimately overthrew the Wicked Queen, didn't she? Let's see. By being what, pure... She was pure, and the Wicked Queen was overthrown. I have no idea how that works. Cause we'll have this... to do Wicked someday. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Snow White and Seven Dwarves. It'll be our best, be our best episodes ever. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. 
Uh, hell. <laughs> All right. Well, do you guys have anything else for this uh, set stretch of chapters? This was a real fun read on every chapter, inclu- including uh, Shed's killing spree. Dude, that rooftop stuff, it was amazing. It was great. It was very tense and at the same time comical. Yes. Because of the person that was getting away with this. God, and ha- and he, had a a, he had to use cowardice to such an effect that he he was able to lure people into false senses of of security and then he offed them. And Great that's why stuff. I think that he's not as much of a loose thread as Asa. The rooftop scene was awesome. It really made me think of like a D and D encounter where you're oh, in the, yeah. you're in the fog and you're playing sound tricks against the Over enemy. Here. Yeah. And then like you take them out one or two at a time. I really like that encounter. I thought a lot about it in gaming terms as far as like a real easy story. I just need this money track down. And you know, it's like a little city adventure type thing. And it doesn't have to pay off, but it sets a a chain of motions to go on in the story. Pretty awesome. I I dug it. I dug it, too. The next episode is going to cover chapters 19 through 25. And that'll be coming to us in about nine days' time. Welcome back to the Black Company, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Later, everyone. Aloha. Aloha.